Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Are we are we on? Are we on? The yes, record? and just make sure your mics are turned on. My light is my my light is turned on. Welcome everyone to tonight's hybrid council or not hybrid city workshop meeting between the city council of city civic center advisory committee and the finance advisory um, committee. And would staff call the roll? Thank you, Chair O'Brien. Uh, for the Civic Center Advisory Committee, uh, Member Kohu. Here. Member Jankovic. Here. Member, uh, member, uh, member, um, uh, member Lacombe. She's Here. Yeah. Member Petru. I believe she said she was attending by Zoom. She is attending remotely. And we could proceed. Member Sayow. Present. And Chair O'Brien. Here. And for, and I'm going to read for the the, the, the finance advisory committee too. Um, Member McAllister, I don't believe he's attending. Uh, Member Johnson, some of them are attending remotely, but uh, Member Vlaco, yes, here. Member Seal. Member Yorman. Vice Chair Brown. No. And Chair Lewis. Okay. Okay. With us, I have a pleasure of allegiance. Vice Chair Jankovic, if you need to question, please. Please raise your right hand, Mr. Hurt. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Thank you. Are there any other members of your council here that have seen me? Okay. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? I'll motion. Second. 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 Is there a second? Second. Motion has been moved and seconded. Um, any discussion? Hearing none, if we would call the roll. I, I, I mean, we can uh, do it by, by acclaim. If there's no objection. Acclamation without objection is so ordered. Um, I should ask the staff if there are any public comments this evening. We have not received any. Okay. In that case, uh, it's my sincere pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, presenter, um, Orion Fulton. He's an associate principal with the renowned firm of Arup. Orion will be facilitating the workshop titled, How Do We Pay It? The Nuts and Bolts of Financing City Projects. I'd like to thank the members of FAC and, C and CSAC and the subcommittees um, consisting of Paul Sayo, Jessica Riaco, and Raquel Brown for their efforts to make this workshop happen. Uh, there will be time for question and answer after the presentation. And now I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Fulton. Thank you, Chair O'Brien. Uh, nice to see everybody uh, and to be here tonight. Um, I am um, going to go through a presentation for you. And let me make sure that we have it set up quickly. Let's see if this works. Okay. Um, we're going to run through three major components tonight. We're going to talk about the delivery of major projects, financing major projects, and then funding. And after some discussion, we've we um, we've landed on this this order because there's a lot of principles in project delivery we'd like to cover initially in, in the delivery section before talking about financing and funding. Um, I'm going to pause at the end of each of these sections for questions. 
Um, I'm also happy to be interrupted and have questions or clarifications. Um, I recognize we have a lot to cover, um, and I want to make this as useful as possible for, for you all. So please interrupt and ask questions. <clears throat> Um, and, and Ryan, if I can just say, I, I encourage, you know, this is a workshop, so I encourage you to do that. I've seen the presentation. There was a session earlier this afternoon that was staffed. There's there's a lot of information, and I think it's, it's, it's really good, helpful information. We're all going to learn from this. But in just let's keep it very casual where if things come up, you have an, a question, ask Ryan. He, he's, he's more than equipped to answer the question. Um, information on what you're being presented so you're suggesting we we dispense with customary formalities and uh, yes it's a workshop so you don't need to be Perfect. as formal okay. here um okay so unless there's any other questions i'll go ahead and, and and dive in um so the first question i or set of questions i want to discuss is why do we need the project? And then secondly, how should we build it? So inherently in those two questions, there's, there's two sort of fundamental decisions behind them. Is the investment decision, right? Should the project be pursued, yes or no? Why should you pursue it? What's the narrative around the project? Um, what are the drivers behind the project? What are your, the outcomes that you're looking for by doing the project? The procurement decision is once you've decided that the project is worth pursuing, is how do you get it built and how do you operate and maintain it? And those are fundamentally different questions because those are about the risk inherent in building the project. It's about the trade-offs of funding and financing and, and external market factors that you can't control, such as the labor market or the cost of materials or the lease rates in, in a local market area. So there are there are elements that, that then influence how you, say, go to market with your project. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the investment decision, and then we'll talk about the procurement decision. So in the, in the investment decision, fundamentally, you're planning your project, right? So you want to make sure that you are clear on the outcomes and objectives of the project. Right, projects have many different reasons for going forward. Um, improving seismic safety, like down the street in Long Beach. Um, improving services, uh, lowering costs. Um, trying to drive economic development. There's a whole different, there's a, these are things that are really important to land on early in a project's uh, development because it becomes the narrative of of why you're doing the project. Um, I put on here uh, monetizing land. Um, I like to talk to clients about this because that's often conflated with an outcome for a project. And, and I like I think that's more about funding and creating your, your place making by potentially selling land or renting land to a private developer if you're a, if you're a government agency. But that's not really the outcome. The outcome might be to improve the built environment or to create more access to open space or um, to provide amenities in a community. And the way you do that is you sell some land or you ground lease something to, to a private entity that creates more of a mixed use with, say, a government use. Um, whatever it is, there's a process of stakeholder engagement, speaking to the community, speaking to elected officials. There's a there's a host of stakeholders that have opinions about what the outcomes should be. And um, there's a process that you go through to land on and, and kind of come to some consensus around what, what the project outcomes are. <clears throat> on the other side of the screen, you have now all of the, the steps and, and uh, elements of defining the project, right? From where is it going to be located to how big and what are the trade-offs of the program that you're going to put in this building or in this park or how many lanes on the bridge you're going to build? Um, how is this asset going to perform? Is it, um, um, and how do you measure that? And and how does that then help you understand whether you've met your out, the outcomes and objectives that you're looking for? You need to understand how much that 
that facility is going to cost. Um, that cost directly relates to how much money you may have on hand, how much money you may need to borrow, what new funding mechanisms you might need to put in place in order to pay for it. Um, and then you ultimately have to go through a process of evaluating your project options. And you always have more than one alternative for a project. Um, in California, you typically, a lot of this comes um, into focus through the environmental process. Um, and that, that process um, is handled through the, the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA. Um, and that process is where you define the project, you evaluate the, the project impacts on the environment, and, and to some extent to society. And, and then there's a public process where people comment and you respond to those comments, ultimately leading to some type of final um, document like an environmental impact report or a negative declaration. And there, there's other um, types of documentation that you do under CEQA um, to evaluate those impacts and look at some of the trade-offs and ultimately declare what your preferred project is. Um, it's also the process where you you it's a crucible for stakeholder opinion, right? There's there's sort of proactive conversations that you have preparing the project, talking about outcomes, defining the project, but ultimately um, the CEQA process is where you um, you know you hear from your opposition, you hear from your supporters, you get good input from different stakeholders who maybe have expertise in different areas. Um, such as like nonprofit environmental groups or whatever, and ultimately you you come to some form of understanding and you move forward with your preferred project. Um, there's many other details you need to cover. What I'm trying to lay the groundwork for are are the are the the bit the big building blocks that you need to have in place to make this investment decision. Because once the environmental work is done, and that sometimes can is not a it's not a uh, it can be an expensive proposition. When that's done, at some point, the the body that's governing the project has to make a decision. Okay, we have our preferred project. We think we have the money to do it. Now we want to move forward. So then the question becomes, well, how do you do it? And we're going to talk about that in a moment. So for this for this presentation, I've created a hypothetical um, project. There's a new government building. There's a you want to centralize parking because you have some great land assets and you a bunch of surface parking lots that are not of highest and best use. You've got land values have appreciated, and you want to put a park there. Um, so you want to centralize the parking and build a, build a civic amenity at, while also getting getting some of your say your government staff consolidated in a new facility. Um, this is not meant to reflect your civic center project. This, these are elements from projects I've worked on over in my career that are typical of a of a government project. The construction the all in total cost is 120 million dollars, and I've represented that here in terms of your capital costs. The building is 85 million, the garage is 15, and the park's gonna cost you about 20 million. These are your initial estimates. And let's say just for purposes of this discussion, when you refine your costs and you get to your final, your, you know, you've, you've really refined the project, these are, these are your costs going forward. So now you've got approval, you have an environmental clearance, and it's time to address the question of how you're gonna build this project. <clears throat> So um, this, is a, this is a busy slide. I'm going to spend a little bit of time walking you through this. A lot of acronyms here, but this is a graphic to summarize your range of options for delivering projects. On your far left is Design, Bid, Build, or DBB. Um, that is traditional public works. Okay, This is where you have a design contract with a company maybe like Arup or a, an engineering firm and they or an architecture firm and they design the project for you based on your EIR sort of definition of the project and they design it to a point where a contractor can come in and provide you with a price um, you then enter into a construction agreement with that with that private entity um, and they are supposed to go out and build the project for you. You have to have your own, 
you, you either pay cash or you have financing or you have some form of paying that contractor to build the project as you've envisioned it and designed it. There's no operations and maintenance. When they're done building the project, there's substantial completion. Typically, there's like a, a fire marshal sign-off on, on, uh, on final occupancy for if it's a building. And then you take control of the site um, or you move in and the contractor's pretty much done, subject to certain laws around um, defects and other construction warranties. On the other extreme, on the far right, this is where um, you you might have a, um, a a private entity doing everything, right? You know what you want to build, say, like a stadium, or a um, another example might be um, a, a parking garage, or maybe it's a, um, a cineplex, or it's a maybe it's a skating rink where they have like it's a quasi-public, but it's a privately developed project, and the entity is effectively coming in to give you a full turnkey project. They're going to they're gonna own and operate it. They're going to design and build it. They're going to finance it. Um, it says the word privatization there because sometimes these projects are an actual sale of an asset in, for example, a um, a, a district energy system in a, at a, camp, a college campus. Um, they want someone else to take over those operations and ownership of that plant to invest capital into it, and they have a, a long-term like concession, if you will, to do all of that because it's, higher ed is not in the business of running energy plants. Um, but this is this is at the other sort of extreme where you don't care about ownership. What you care about is the impact that the project has, such as creating a, a wonderful public space like an ice rink or. Uh, something that is private, it's a private operation, but it has a lot of, there's a lot of uh, public benefit in building it. Now, in between, there's a lot of different options, and I'll quickly walk you, walk you through them. Um, so going back to the left, the construction manager or general contractor, this is commonly referred to as like construction manager at risk. You hire a third-party consultant to validate the price of the general contractor and they are responsible for managing the 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 scope and budget to deliver the project on time and there's and they have some penalties that they incur if there are scheduled delays or cost overruns um, it's a it's what's and what's happening going from design bid build and you're moving right is that there's a slow transfer of risk from the public sector to the private partner. So you imagine in the extremes, design, bid, build, the public sponsor of that project, say public works department, they pretty much own all the risk in the project, except for maybe some of the construction terms that the contractor is responsible for. But if there's a change order or the budget's not right or the schedule was too aggressive or pretty much anything that happens, what we typically see in California are contractors coming back for, you know, contract extensions, schedule extensions, more budget, et cetera, the change order process. Um, and so as you move from left to right, the first set of risks you're trying to manage, right, so getting into design build as well, is an increasing effort to pass that design and construction risk to the private sector. <clears throat> So in design build, you're, you're taking the additional step of saying, I'm only going to design this far enough to, that I can get some certainty on what I think the price and cost is of the project. And then I'm going to make the, the, the design build community competitively bid their price to deliver this project for me. So it's not just construction, but it's actually marrying of the, the, the detailed design and the procurements of some of those materi of the, of the materials and the labor plus the construction and getting all that done on time and on budget. So when you talk about design build, oftentimes you hear people talking about turnkey, right? Turnkey means there's the contract actually states what the scheduled date is for completion. And there are penalties like liquidated damages or other things that the contractor is responsible for if they don't meet it. 
<clears throat> and Orion, typically for a design build, it's a fixed cost, right? You, the city comes up with um, the basic plans. They hand it over to uh, a, a developer and saying, okay, now you're going to take it from here. You're going to see it through, and this is at the fixed cost. Yeah, you, you competitively, typically you competitively bid a 30% designed project where uh, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's up to maybe 50%, but you design it far enough to give yourself comfort and to give enough direction to the contracting community that they can competitively bid a price and schedule to you and you select them to deliver that. In design build procurement, you don't always select things on lowest price. You sometimes start selecting on best value. So you may pick somebody that says, I'm not the lowest price, but I can guarantee you the schedule, right? Or you might pick someone that says, I'll give you the cheapest price, but I'm giving you the longest schedule because I need to, there's certain risks that I need to mitigate by asking for a longer schedule. But, and there's variables you can control. But yes, fundamentally, Ara, it's, it, design build is all about cost and schedule certainty. And, and with... Typically for the city, the capital projects that we have constructed have all fallen under um, the design, bid, and build. That's, that's the typical structure for a public works project, particularly for the city. And in that case, when you uh, issue that bid, you are, you are awarding it to the lowest bidder. Where, like Orion said here, as you start to move over on that spectrum there, you're now, like in the design build, you have more leverage in terms of what you're negotiating um, or who you're awarding that contract to. So, like, for ex most recently, Ladera Linda, which was just approved by the city council uh, March 1st, that was a design build, bid build project. We had a different, enti uh, a different company design it. We, we had someone develop the bid for it, and then we, we, put, we awarded the contract to an, another um, company. So, so that's sort of how that was all split up. So we wouldn't necessarily be just looking at the low, I mean, just from a community perspective, looking at the lowest bid for the Civic Center. It's really, I think, you know, he was pointing out an interesting thing that sometimes our schedule, you know, it, we, we're going to pay it one way or another if, you know, if someone's offering a tighter schedule and, and you know, penalties if they don't, I think it... And, and that'll ultimately, we don't know at this point. It's too early in the process. And, and so we will know once, and that's why what's, what, what Orion is going over right now is project delivery. Based on the project, uh, how, whatever we select as the project delivery will determine all those other factors. Copy, thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> if, if, for example, we had a phased project, can you move to different risk locations or yes okay so like the 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 sample project you might say okay well the the move of the new the new building and parking garage i want that turnkey right that's a more complex that's over 100 million dollars of work i need that done in 3 years cuz my lease is expiring or something and then the park you could come in and procure separately you know fully design the park with the community and everything and then and then contract that out separately as a design bid build. Yeah. Question. So, yes. Uh, would you go back to uh, defining the requirements uh, and someone designed to that with the limitations and parameters to the, that bound the requirements rather than just go ahead and design it? So I think you're saying the what are the parameters you're you're writing before you before you try to contract with someone for no, be, before you, no you talked about getting a design mm -hmm. wouldn't it uh, in, wouldn't it be more appropriate to sit down and quantify the requirements and the boundaries of those requirements before you give it to somebody to design. I, we've yes. done that. We've got the programming from, isn't that what Gensler did for us? I mean, as far as the programming but goes. The civics. Right, right. Is, but is that not the same? Yeah. To the team here. Yeah, well, certainly that is what, uh, th through the program document, which council approved back in December, well, he approved uh, two years ago, and then 
approved the validated document in December, you really identified components and some things that might be considered as well, and also assigned some rough professional square footage estimates to those components. So that's where we're at right now with the, the program document. Yeah, exactly. In terms of what do you want or need, actually, to start out, what do you need in the project? Right. I think we've done that. I mean, I, you know, we might need to update it with the, you know, the folks that are based okay. you know, on population. And that, that's when you give it to design rather than just begin a design for Absolutely. a project. Yep. Okay. Yeah. yeah. A, sec a, a second question. Uh, what's your view on liquidated damages? Uh, in terms of missing a schedule, uh, how do you define what the liquid damages are uh, for a schedule and how do you keep uh, out of uh, court to try and resolve it? Um, yeah, great question. Um, that's a frequent topic in contract negotiations. Um, typically, the lawyers would tell you, I'm not a lawyer, is that... Um, it's, it's defined by how well you can define the harm that's created to you by not having access to the facility. So if the facility is late um, and you're not really being harmed, it's hard to argue that you're due liquidated damages. But um, you have um, some cases where that's actually quite clear, like you have a lease that's expiring and you need to move into your new facility. And if you are late, you have to pay more rent. That's a very clear cost to you to do that. Um, it's a whole territory that, that um, is, it's good legal territory for debating with, with contractors what, what is and isn't. Um, in some of these delivery methods, the concept of liquidated damages in and of itself is not sort of a, a sufficient hammer to, f to finish on time. Sometimes there's, al there's also, we're going to talk about here, there's, there's, um, there's finance um, and finance deadlines and when things are, when interest payments need to start and commitments that you need to make in the financing documents that also create an urgency to complete projects. Um, and even within design build, there are also... Um, different forms of design build um, that have varying levels of cost and schedule certainty, terms around cost and schedule certainty. Um, liquidated damages is not the only one. Well, my, my concern is to, for instance, in the city, uh, something doesn't get done in time and you're going to have to spend more staff time, but we don't log staff time, uh, we treat it as overhead, and so how do we compensate for that? Uh, wouldn't a, a, an agreement in the contract to just say, okay, for every day you're late, you're so much penalty? Yes. And not worry about defining all those different issues and getting into a contest of who's right or wrong, or, or is that really a, a, a damage or not? It, yeah. it avoids a lot of arguments. My experience is that the, the, the better you define how liquidated damages are arrived at in the contract, you have more success later in arbitration if an issue comes up of how you did define it. If you don't define it and both parties agree and it's uncertain, when you get to arbitration or uh, you know, worst case litigation, you're just in, on bad footing. So typically that's why the legal teams will try to articulate how you're arriving at what the LDs are for a project. I think staff time is, I would say that's a legitimate concern and that's a cost to the city. Um, so I don't, I don't want to go down the LD rabbit hole, but LDs are one of the key t tools for creating um, schedule certainty. Okay. Yep. Um, there are all the other forms of guarantees and stuff as well. Um, in, in the blue box, the next turn, the next thing you see here is design, build, operate, maintain, and this is a model where you're not asking. There's no finance yet, but you're asking the design build team. You're asking a developer to consider the life cycle costs of projects. So, 
Many of you, if you've been involved in any kind of capital project or decision making, maybe even in your own home, right? Is it, is, is, are you making a decision based on first cost? Or are you making a decision based on like the longevity of what you're, you know, are you buying carpet? Or are you buying marble? Or are you buying um, a 30 year comp roof? Or are you buying a 50 year comp roof, right? These are life cycle questions that you're asking yourself and you can think of a, a large project. There's a myriad of systems and structures and things that you're investing in that <clears throat> when you only have to worry about the first costs and the construction, you don't need to think about when that has to get replaced, right? Unless there are instances where you could be very specific about what type of material you want um, or what performance it has to meet. But by and large, what we're trying to accomplish here is we're trying to create the contractual incentive to optimize that first cost decision versus the life cycle cost and to have evidence that a decision's been made that brings value to the public sector. Um, you also have your own choices. You can say, we need to get this project built. Our budget only goes so far. We can't afford X. Right, but you make that trade-off knowing full well that you're replacing that flooring in seven years, not 50. Um, and so that's this is where we start to get into the P3 realm where you're trying to look at whole life cycle cost and the implications of it up front when you're doing your budgeting and your design work. The next concept is finance. Um, and this is actually a really important one for the other parts of the, 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 the presentation. When you, when you see the design build finance or the design build finance operate maintain, what you're seeking here is an arm's length financing from the city or whatever public entity we might be talking about. Um, and that has a couple of key ramifications. The first one is that when when you're doing contracts, you're not writing the contract for what's going to happen typically. You're writing a contract for what could really go wrong. Okay? So when, when, when you're thinking about um, a contractor defaulting or they've overrun and you said they haven't met the contract and they walk off the job, right? You, or you have a, um, you have a, um, a development entity that's you've tasked with building something in a P3, that becomes their that becomes their problem because they have an arrangement with their lenders to complete this project, right? A bank loan. Some in some cases, certain types of bonds, bond uh, transactions. Um, you have a relationship between the entity that you have a contract with to deliver the project. But they, they, one of their responsibilities is to secure the financing. So just like when you buy a house and you have an arrangement with a, with a lender to, to give you the money, one of the things they look for is like, how much money do you have down, right? Do you have skin in the game or not? They, you don't finance houses with 100% of a bank's money. They want you to have money in the, in the deal. And that's because they want you to take care of that asset, right? That's collateral for them. If things go wrong, which they do sometimes, they want to come in and take the house. <clears throat> now, in, in infrastructure and P3s, same principle applies, right? This, if you're entering into a contract with a developer and you want to have them secure the financing, you're saying, I'm entering into a contract and I'm willing to pay you X, but in return for that, what I want you to do is execute the finance, execute the construction, and to do so, I want you to go convince a lender that you've got a good plan, and you secure the financing, and you hand me the keys when you're done. So from a risk, now remember we're talking about project risks, so when we're, when we're talking about risk mitigation, you're basically saying to the developer, I'm not going to be the only judge of whether you've got a good plan here. The lender is going to make that independent judgment themselves. And by the way, that lender is going to have first rights to fix this project if something goes wrong. They're coming to you, Mr. or Mrs. Developer, first, 
right? And your equity might be uh, your equity might be on the line if there is equity before the city or the the public sector gets involved. Now, in some other talk, I can come back and we can talk about some of the legal rights, like step in rights and things. Ultimately, y- your contract, like in design build finance you would still have rights in that situation because they're building this thing for you. But fundamentally, you're telling the development, the developer in a design build finance, I want you to take care of that for me. And you know, one of the arguments against doing this is, well, that means the cost of capital, the, the, what they're going to charge me to go take that risk is higher because they can't turn around and ask the city to cover that um, if, if there's a downside scenario. Um, so that's really the, the essence of the design build finance. Now, if you tack on the O&M, what you're telling the developer is, I want you to take responsibility for optimizing the performance of this asset long term. So not only do I want you to f- give me a turnkey financing and construction, I want you to do that with the, perform- with the performance metrics I've given you in my contract. So like again, for example, in Long Beach, we set um, energy targets for the buildings long term. So not only did they have to design them with those in mind, but now they actually have to run the building and prove to us that they're getting the energy savings that we asked for up front. And if they don't, there's a contractual mechanism to, to adjust what our payments are to the developer because the building isn't performing the way it's supposed to. And you're saying, you're asking the developer to say, you need to consider that when you're designing and building this project because we want to have a building that is well maintained, well operated, and is efficient for 20 years, for 30 years. So they have to weigh those options and how they develop the project. So that's the essence of the DBFOM. I just wanted to point out I, that's something that will probably, I mean, when do we? When do we ask for the performance metrics on what we're what, what we want for the civic center? I mean, I just I don't know when would that would get instantiated, but I mean, I'm just because he does raise a point. I'm like, we would probably want to get and have an idea of you know what what that is that that criteria we would want to build into you know that how how we're gonna be doing the lending and, process. And here. and I would think that that would happen later. I mean, we don't even have a design yet, right. so I mean that'll come later. I think. What's really important, and I don't want to spend too much time here, and we can kind of keep moving, but yep. this slide here is the reason why we're having this workshop this evening, and I'll tell you why. Um, a couple years ago, some of the members of the committee may recall, we were we were in preparing to put out an RFP um, to move into a phase of the project um, to onboard uh, a developer for a P3. We were talking about P3. We were going to get some information and, and do that. Before we put that RFP out uh, in this, for the Civic Center project, we realized what you're seeing in that blue box, there are different models to a P3. So you generally hear people say P3, 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 but there's so much more to it. And, and it was at that point that we realized we, we're, we're putting, we're going out when we still don't really have a good grasp of everything. And so we stepped back and we decided to enter a different phase for the Civic Center project. And that was to uh, explore and to obtain more information. And what you'll see here is there are three different types of P3s. They each have a different cost because they, there's, they're, the very um, far right is the design, build, finance, operate, maintain. Someone once told me that that's like the Cadillac of P3s that, that has everything in it versus the design, build, operate, and maintain. So keep that in mind when you're looking at the, their different models, and there are also different models in the, in the public process as well. Yeah. <clears throat> and when I say finance here, that's the project finance. That's asking the third party to secure it. In any number of these on the left-hand side, there could be public finance, right? There could You could issue a bond that's going to pay for the project. And we're going to talk about financing next, but we're trying to get these first principles uh, across the spectrum of op- delivery options in place before we go there. 
Um, I'm going to move through some of this quickly. Um, you will have a copy of this, but this is sort of summarizing what some of the points I made um, in comparing the kind of bookends of the public works to typical delivery of design bid build versus a P3. And in this case, we're talking about uh, a DBF or a DBFOM. Um, <clears throat> you can see some of the, the, key, the key differences here, how far you need to take design, how fixed and certain the, the price and schedule certainty is in the contract. Um, Non-recourse means that it's arm's length from the, the, from the city. It means, it, it's kind of how I described it. If something bad happens, the contractor walks off the job or goes into default or something, that's not the problem for the city to solve. Whereas in public works, that's directly the city's problem because the contract is directly with them. Um, and then in terms of operations and maintenance, some, sometimes cities want to do a, DB, uh, a DBFM. They don't want you to touch, they don't want a developer touching the operations because it's, you know, it's an, it's an asset and you have operators that are prepared to operate whatever facility this is, like bridge engineers or an EOC or a, I don't know, operations of a, of, a, of a building. You don't need them to do that, but you want them to maintain it. So sometimes there's a, DB, a DBFM. And, and Orion, on the slide here under the column of DB, uh, the design bid build, build. Bid mm -hmm. build you, under financing, you have municipal bonds, but that's not the only way to finance a project. And I know it's, you'll get into yeah, that. Yeah, that's, that's common, but you know, you, you could have, I mean, there could be no financing. It could just be cash, right? It could be pay go. When you have the money, you, you make payments. Um, it could be, um, and we're going to talk about all the different flavors of municipal bonds. Um, Not the only. I mean, for Ladera Linda, you know, we didn't go. To, we didn't use a municipal bond to pay for that project, which was a, a DBB. Right. Yeah. Um, this is examples of the risk allocation I was talking about. These are not all the risks, but this is a smattering of the most common ones. And you can see this is we're illustrating the how you're transferring some of the rights uh, or sorry risks. The shared risks are important because one of the principles of P3s and project finance is that you give the risk to the party that's best able to manage it. So underground conditions that nobody knows anything about. You you strike Native American remains or dinosaur bones or an underground storage tank that wasn't on the, you know, on the Alta survey, or you didn't have a phase two done, environmental done, and so there's unknown things. Well, you could ask the private sector to take that risk, but they're going to charge you an arm and a leg because they don't know either. Or you agree to kind of share costs if something comes up. And so sh sharing, agreeing to sharing costs is not solely a concept solely for P3s, but it's an important one for for projects where there are key unknowns. Um, but you can see again, you know, all, a lot of the risks around the life cycle, around the the um, the the construction, the changes in scope. The reason that's a public chain that's a public risk in a P3 is that's like if an owner changes their mind about something. Like, no, actually, I want four offices instead of three. Well, they're going to charge you for that change order. But if you said, I wanted four offices in my, in my documentation and you gave me three, they haven't performed and, and they've got to fix that on their dime. Um, I'm going to skip over a couple of these definitions because we, we did spend a little bit of time on the, on the range of options, but this gives you... I think this is a great example of our definition of, of P3s, um, right? And I'm going to just touch mostly on the last point. So the value from money to taxpayers. So when you're making this procurement decision in, in the industry, we, we call it a business case. So you know you want to build the project and you're trying to determine how you do an analysis to compare effectively 
the, the, the risk and the risk premium as well as the cost of capital and the timing of the payments, you roll all of that into a, a, business, a business case that helps you evaluate the key options for delivery. And you can look at that in terms of um, what we call net present value. And I'll talk about some of the commercial, the, the financial terms later. But effectively, you look at, you compare these options and you bring them back to the, the value, the dollars today. And you can compare these things and say, I think a, you know, I think a design build finance is going to be the best value for money over a design build finance operate maintain or a DB, uh, design bid build as an example and and the business case will lay out for you why um, some projects some clients um, they the value for money for them is clear and they don't need to pay the time and money to go through this detailed exercise um, others, um, when, especially when they're changing procurement methods from, you know, they've done hundred projects one way and they're making a change to do design build for the first time. They usually want to go through this exercise to really document quantitatively and qualitatively why the shift should create benefits, um, and, and articulate them and be measured against them when they do a different delivery method. Um, that's really the key of a P3 is that you're you're doing the P3 because you're you're getting some benefits. Not it's not just about raising costs and you know private equity making money, which is a lot of the arguments you hear about P3s. It's are you actually can you define and articulate the value you're getting by changing your procurement method? Um, this slides. I'm going to move quickly through this, but effectively, there's just two types of P3s. There's an availability payment, which is a payment for service. So Long Beach is an example of that. You built me a government center. I'm going to pay you back for having built that correctly and it's operating efficiently as per the contract. Um, there's no revenue being generated. The second kind of P3 is like a toll road or um, a, you know, a public utility is paying a, a private entity to develop a power station or something where there's there's a there's a revenue there's revenue being generated by building the project and that's helping pay for creating revenue directly for the project um, in p3s there's a number of players um, and the next few slides just talk about who some of these players are right there's the lenders um, there's the private developer or concessionaire um, and the team that they need to bring to the table, depending on what you're doing, and then you have the the basically the public, which is the the government sponsor, and that you know that could be federal, state, city, or local agencies. And each of these core players has an ecosystem of 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 stakeholders and secondary partners around them. Um, not to go through all of them, but just some examples. Right in some P3s. Or some some a lot of projects, the public sector is doing the financing. So you've got your your director of finance, you've got bond council, you've got all the people you need to to execute that that financing. You've got the environmental process I described to you earlier in the project planning stage. Um, you have the social matter office. That's kind of a, a a British term, but that's like basically communications and stakeholders in the community. Um, you have a number of third parties that that are potentially um, key stakeholders, um, and then the private sector has to also have a whole ecosystem of of people around them participating to get the project done. Um, oh, Ryan, um, going back to that slide where you've got the the key roles and the different entities, in the case of of the P three, and that's what we're talking about right at the moment. The Long Beach project, for example, which is a civic, there was that city hall. Does the city own the land and the project, or are they? Because many times I've heard it's like a lease. You're 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 paying for thirty years until you get the keys, and then you then you own it. Yep. Who? So, using uh, Long Beach as an example, 
Does Long Beach own the project or are, did they hand it over to the developer? The developer and the lenders own it and we're releasing it back until that 30-year term and then they, they take ownership. Can you kind of explain that? Yeah. Um, I'm actually going to ask if I can hold that to the case studies because I have two comparing okay. case studies that will answer that question directly. Okay. I'll the short hold, answer I'll is yes, that. Long Beach owns their property and they have an availability payment. And then they have some private, some land that they sold for private development. So they have where the government center, the, the, civic, the civic center is and the park and library, that's all public land. And the developer has access, they have a, like a site access agreement so they can come on the site and build. Okay. Right? And they have, a, they have a project agreement that says what they're supposed to build and by when and how much, et cetera. In the other example, uh, Vermont Corridor, it's a lease leaseback. So there's a nonprofit that actually owns the building and does the financing and hires the developer and does all the work under their umbrella. And the county is making effectively rent payments and leasing back the building over a period of time until it's fully theirs. Okay. Now, if push came to shove, is it the county's building? Yes. But the way they structured the financing it's the nonprofit, right, that exists solely to get this project done for the county, but it's an arm's length sort of ownership until that is done. Okay. Really quick, just that, that diagram also I think is going to be, I mean, I, I almost want to like put it as a big poster in our meetings because I think, you know, especially when we go forward and we get closer to paying, you know, who's going to pay for it? This kind of, you know, the, be the taxpayer and that you, you hear about all these homeowners complaining, oh, it's going to be too expensive. I'm like, well, I, you can almost put a little arrow to each one of these bubbles to say how much you're actually contributing to that. I mean, this, this could be something forward thinking to show how everything is going to get distributed across the, the you know, the stakeholders. Because I, I just, you know, Lara Linda's an example and I think others where, you know, how we're paying for it. This, this diagram just could be very helpful over yeah. Um, okay. <clears throat> this is um, this is. I think this is the. There's one more slide after this, and and then we'll get to the case studies. So in a P3, you're hiring. The SPV stands for special purpose vehicle. So when you hire a development entity, you're not hiring the parent company. They're creating a company that's going to deliver the project for you, a limited liability corporation typically. That company is set up solely for the purpose of developing the project. That company gets staffed by professionals. Um, sometimes those professionals come from the developer themselves. Um, and typically you can, you can write in your procurement your procurement documents, who the key staff are, who have to be involved at what stage, et cetera. And that dictates partly who, who this company, like gets, who's being staffed inside this company. Um, that entity is your developer and then, or project company, and then they arrange the project, right? So they, they hire the design build team. They hire the maintenance or any um, operation contractors. Um, they also um, secure the equity, typically from their parent company. Um, sometimes there's other equity providers, if there's equity, right? Not all projects, not all P3s have, have equity, but typically they do. And then they also arrange the financing, right? The, we're talking about DBFOM. And they do all of that based on the terms of the agreement for the services and facilities that you've entered into as the public entity with that developer. Um, you can see that this diagram is to kind of help summarize what the key sort of relationships are, right? So you see both lenders and equity providing funding in the form of loans or, or, or equity and then they are being paid back um, in a hierarchy. There's a hierarchy to how they get paid back, but they're getting paid back. And then there's also these service agreements between the design builder and the O&M provider and that project company to, to, to perform certain things. 
Um, but all of it is happening because that public partner in the contract is committed to make payments to that project company. And so this is projects, that relationship between the public partner and the, and the, and the developer is where there needs to be um, a, a creditworthy public partner, right? So the, the, the lenders on the left are looking at the public partner to see how highly rated they are, how creditworthy they are, what's the, what's the um, situation of their finances and their, their ob payment obligations before the project and with the project. Um, they're also looking at the project itself. How well is the project being designed and planned for? Um, because very often in project finance, like, like home mortgages, there's physical collateral that you're committing if, if you don't pay. Um, and that's what the lenders want because the lenders don't want, banks don't want risk, right? Bondholders don't want risk. They want to give you money and have you be successful and you pay them back an interest, you know, an interest rate on that, on that loan. Um, likewise, equity wants the same thing, but equity is their skin in the game. Um, <clears throat> so this, this document, this diagram is largely for P3s, but it, I'm going to come back to it with some of the other financing options that, that we're going to talk about. Here, Ryan, quick question. Going back to that slide, you said that the company usually creates an SPV, right, as an LLC? Yeah. So when you're contracting, like the public partner contracts, do they contract solely with SPV or both the parent company as well as the LLC? Typically, it's just the LLC, but in some cases, you can ask for things like parent company guarantees. Um, or the parent company, yeah, you can get commitments from the parent company as well if you need to. Yeah. Oftentimes, the lenders kind of lead that discussion. Yeah. Um, this is a quick plug about life cycle. So the red piece of the pie is 40%. That's the design and construction cost. So I'm going to talk about Long Beach in a moment, but... Generally speaking, five hundred million dollar project. Forty percent of that was the design and that's the design and construction cost. But the life cycle cost of that of those buildings is a little bit more than a billion dollars. And why is that? Well, you've got a lot of maintenance over a forty year period. You also have all of the energy that you need to procure for that building and the other utilities. And you have rehabilitation and replacement that happens over that time frame. So in the United States, we don't like to talk about the 60%, right? It's not capital costs. We like to talk about capital costs, first costs. How much money do we need to borrow to build this thing? But we don't talk about how much O&M dollars it's going to take to maintain this facility. And there's trade-offs, right? Um, cities will tell you, on the one hand, they realize that um, not maintaining their facilities creates deferred maintenance, and that's a liability, right? At some point, you can't bring buildings back. They get to a point where they're too old, and to modernize them is going to be the same cost as replacing them. That's what ha kind of happened to Long Beach. Um, but a lot of cities will then say on the other side of that coin is they want that flexibility because they have to deal with cyclical realities of, of the economy, right? Right. You can have lean years, and you don't want to have effectively money wrapped up in a P3 pre-funding maintenance, you know, ma uh, uh, maintenance budgets and replacement budgets and all the great things that that P3s do um, to guarantee asset preservation, because that's money that's now locked up and you can't use to pay your police department when times are tight. So, you know, P3s while they are super beneficial in helping you manage a a the life cycle costs of of a of a of an asset they also commit you to doing that and so that's that's one of the key trade offs that cities have to wrestle with is is this facility critical enough to us that it's worth wrapping up those commitments up front right it's a real it's a real trade off um, but with a P3, you are gar more guaranteeing yourself that you're going to have an asset in good condition at the end of the term of the contract. Whereas if you don't, 
the public sector by and large is not good at maintaining their assets over time because in lean years they use money to do other things besides fix their boilers or change their roof or whatever it is. Um, last concept before we, before we move on to, to we're going to get to the financing and funding um, and we're at the one hour mark. Um, this concept that you see on the on the screen here is what we refer to as like a waterfall. And in P3s, just like a general fund, or for that matter, even in, in you know, um, running a corporation, you have a hierarchy of costs. In the case of a P3, the higher, the highest, and the highest first priority is funding the maintenance of the facility, because remember, that's the collateral. You have to take care of the asset. The, fund, the, the lenders are going to require that of you. The next thing is to make sure that you have a reserve to pay for those future costs. Then you have to make sure you cover all of the debt. And only after you've done all of those things can you start to talk about, well, equity is getting paid back or you have a surplus of some kind that you can use to upgrade the facility or, you know, include that thing that you couldn't up front because you didn't have the funding, but now the project is generating more money or something and you're able to make additional um, upgrades. And, and that hierarchy is very important, right? The rating agencies look at it, the lenders look at it, um, and you have to demonstrate that, that your availability payments from the government, when you're paying those monthly or semi-annual or annual checks, the project company has to make sure that all these buckets fill up, including their equity bucket, but that's down at the bottom. General fund works the same way, right? Revenues from the city go into the general fund. You have to take care of things like payroll and pensions and key obligations. If you have a debt program, you got to make sure that you don't default on any of your debt. And then only after that can you start to talk about um, surplus funds or other non-restricted funds that you can use for, for other things. Um, <clears throat> We'll, in the funding section, we'll talk about you know special funds like sales taxes or tax increment or something where you earmark certain revenues that don't go through the waterfall. They go straight into a separate fund for paying for infrastructure or paying for a project. You know, like the example I give is a the hypothetical you know measure XX. You raise a quarter cent sales tax that goes into a special fund, and that the voters vote to say yes, it's going to be used for these uses only. You know, fixing roads, um, beautifying the city, um, or it's more general, like just city infrastructure. But again, there's a priority. My point here is that there's a priority here, um, and it's an important concept when you're thinking about this procurement decision, what kind of procurement am I trying to action? And do I need to have, is it important to us to have a priority for how these costs are, um, are accounted for and what priority? If you don't do the P3, right, the design build finance or design build or design bid build, those top two buckets go to the bottom. I mean, not in every case, but that's typically what happens. And that's why maintenance money dries up. So Long Beach, to Ara's question, he, it was like a plant. Um, so in Long Beach, there's this is some just basic, basic information about the project, right? That the city and the port were the co-sponsors. The plenary properties, Long Beach was the concession, the SPV that that delivered the project for them. They were that red box in the middle of the, of the diagram. It's about 600,000 square feet of total public facility space. Um, and then there's also private development. There was a, a land sale that helped generate funding for the project, um, about 30 million worth. Um, where the old city hall sits today, that's gonna turn into about 500 units of workforce housing um, at the end of a public project. Um, this project, what I, what I want to highlight for you tonight is um, there's two delivery methods that were used within one project. Why is that? 
well, the city and the library, the, on the city side, they needed to build the city, the library, and the park. The port was going to build their headquarters. The city was in the situation they were in because they deferred their maintenance and their building was not upkept and they needed to replace it. <clears throat> they really were concerned about that long term, that life cycle benefit they were getting from a P3. They also thought that, well, I think we're going to probably finance this ourselves, but we're open to seeing what the the spread is between a private financing and a, and us financing it. They had the debt capacity, if you will, to, to pay for it themselves if they wanted to. Um, they could go out and borrow. They could they could issue a bond and, and like a revenue bond and pay for it. But in the end, they chose to not do that because the cost of capital was effectively the same, slightly higher to to have a private arm's length financing through plenary. <clears throat> um, and they got, so they got much cleaner, clearer risk transfer without really paying a premium for it. Um, the port, on the other hand, is in the bond market all the time. They're financing hundreds of millions of dollars worth of capital projects in the port on any given year. And so they approached the bond market almost programmatically. And so their, their view was, we do O&M on our facilities all day long. We've got an engineering department. We have a big operations and maintenance department. <clears throat> Running this building is really not that hard for us. We're fine with that. But I don't want to have any risk until you hand me the keys to my building. I want to worry about my port. And when you're done, you hand me the keys, I'll borrow some money you know, in a bond issuance, and I'll buy you out. And so this DBF was used con a construction loan. So Plenary went out and secured a three and a half year construction loan from Sumitomo Bank of Japan to cover all the costs of the project up front. Um, and that arrangement was between Plenary, their contractor, and, and the bank. And when they finished and they met the, the obligations of substantial completion, the port said, okay, Here's a bunch of money we just raised in the capital markets, you know, a 30-year a bond or something from, from their financing and bought out the bank. And now they're just making, an, they're making these bond payments um, as part of a program at the port. So two clients, one project, but two different approaches to how they thought about this procurement decision that, that I've been talking about for 45 minutes. Um, the other thing is what what Ara mentions, right? Is the land there was there was, it's the land is owned by the city and the port actually because they're subject to Tidelands Trust. There's even more complications. We had to divide this campus up to say, what is what is the port own because they're subject to the Tidelands Trust and the State Lands Commission versus the city, which is a chartered city. So that we had to actually divide this stuff up to get that clear. Um, that's kind of inside baseball stuff, but fundamentally, these two owners owned the project, and it, they, the the agreement with Plenary is a um, it's a service contract to design, build, finance, operate, and, and maintain the, the the facility. The private development, as I said, builds a mixed use district that's good for public safety. It's good for the park. It generates tax revenue, and it also generated. Uh, through a land sale, um, money to pay for the project. You know, what's, in, what's interesting with this um, site, putting it in context, it's one campus um, with multiple buildings, and they each were delivered differently. So just kind of put that in context uh, yeah. to what the Civic Center could be. I mean, we have one campus. We have different buildings that may belong to different entities. There could be different delivery methods for each of those. Yeah, Ryan, you said it's generating revenue from specifically what? Um, the like once they build all that housing, there's going to be property tax and more people living downtown, so there's going to be more sales tax. Yeah, the city didn't bank on that, by the way, but. It was another motivating factor. Plus, you know, as you guys probably know, cities all have to meet these housing requirements uh, in their cities, and so this project became a, a, a platform to get a bunch of that built downtown. It's a pretty complex build, but use 
if you preferred which which option worked better? I mean, if they could have chosen one type of, mm. of option, which I, worked smoother. Um, well, I would say both of them worked pretty well. I mean, plenary, I will give them kudos for really kind of figuring out how to unpack it and convince lenders that they could have two forms of, of debt in the same project because we demarcated things so carefully. So, you know, Sumitomo and eventually the port between the port and the city, they know who owns what. And that's really the most important part of this. You don't want to have, um, we don't want to have things getting commingled because when if a bad thing happens, like a default, and people are going after one another for for claims and things, if you're if if you're not super clear about that demarcation and who owns what, it it can be very difficult. And lenders will oftentimes back away from that kind of thing. So the fact that this ha even happened was was a testament to the 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 um, the plenary team. I, I wouldn't say that DBFM or DBF was better or worse. Each client had their own sort of assessment of the procurement decision that was right for them. I understand that with the courthouse component, uh, there were some private concessions that generated, expected to generate revenue for a long period of time. Do you know anything about that? Yep. So then the, the Long Beach Courthouse had, um, I think, about 50,000 square feet of rentable space that actually was financed with a taxable portion of the overall project because it was it was private use but they did that so they could generate some revenue and create you know food for the judges and the and the the people the jurors and everything yeah it wasn't substantial but it was a it was a small component to the fund financing um, the Vermont Street corridor I'm using this as to contrast because it's a similar kind of building government office building with parking, structured parking. Um, as I was saying to Ara's question, this was a, used a 6320, which is a, it's an IRS code, but effectively it's, they used a nonprofit entity to house the project. And then that nonprofit entity hired the developer who then took care of the design build and the O&M but what they what the nonprofit did is it enabled them to a nonprofit tax exempt entity was borrowing out in the market for tax exempt debt to build a public facility so it was a way of getting sort of that it's an attempt to get that arms length transaction so it's not the county of LA financing it the county of LA is signing up for an obligation to pay that nonprofit, okay? But the nonprofit is ultimately responsible for borrowing the money and distributing the funds and getting the project built and then leasing it to the county. So that sounds like splitting hairs, but from a accounting perspective and a risk management perspective, let's say this project was a, a total disaster, right? And the contractor walks off, you can't find a replacement. Who's holding the bag? Well, the county is not. The nonprofit is. Ultimately, you say in a court of law, like what would happen? The county would probably have to come to the table at some point. But what you're trying to build are like these mitigating mitigating factors and players that have to perform and solve problems before you do as the as the owner that's really the essence and in this case it was done through a lease lease back rather than a, um, a, a like a concession contract okay I'm gonna now pivot and we're gonna talk about um, financing so we've covered we've covered a lot, and that took us an hour or a little more. But I think those terms are really important to understand when you now talk about how do you finance a project. <clears throat> so remember our example: you have 120 million of capital costs. You need 120 million dollars now to build that, right? But of course, you have interest that you've got to account for. So. 
you have $120 million CapEx costs for the project, capital expenditures, but with interest, you're probably going to end up spending $200 million paying that back. Now, it's not that simple, right? Because you don't pay it all back at once. You pay it back over time. So what are some of the key terms we need to keep in mind here? First of all, there's different types of capital. There's, there's your... Um, there's debt, there's equity, and there's cash. And those things have different, can have different restricted uses or not. Um, and we're going to get into the debt stuff uh, as, uh, for most of this section. You also have each of, these, um, each of these types of capital have a cost associated, right? So you all probably have heard and, and believe that you know, tax-exempt financing is the cheapest form of capital because there's no federal tax on it. The federal government says if it's for government use or other qualified uses, we'll waive our federal tax component of that, of that project. So the interest rate is lower. But there's also taxable debt. There's private debt. There's different for flavors of debt. Um, so when you're thinking about that is how much interest are you paying on the money you're borrowing? Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about time value of money. Um, I think most people are familiar with the concept, but I want to make sure we're clear on principles because how you go do that business case that I talked about, remember I was talking about you compare projects on a present value basis. Well, the time value of money is the big driver of why s certain types of procurements and delivery methods have a better present value because you have a lot of payments and costs delayed into the future. And that's a principle of finance that sometimes is conf confounding to, to a lot of people. And you do end up paying more, right? When you buy a house, you plan on making interest payments for a long time, and you end up paying more than your, you know, the, the capital costs of your house. But you do it because maybe interest rates are low, or maybe because you don't have the cash all at once. Or you can make more money putting some of that money somewhere else, not just in property. You invested in stock or something. So there's an opportunity cost associated with that. So we're going to talk about that for a moment. Um, some forms of debt and, and cash, for that matter, if it's coming, you know, it's a form of funding, um, have restricted uses. And finally, we mentioned this, but there's there's an issue. The, there's the concept of credit worthiness, which is, you know, how. That's usually done through a credit rating process, but public entities get rated on how good they are at meeting their payment obligations or, or servicing their debt. <clears throat> so we have this interest that we've got to pay for, but it doesn't all happen at once. And we have some equity in this deal. You don't always have equity, but we have some equity in this deal, and, and that equity wants a higher return than, than the debt. And so you have to that interest is a blended, there's a like a weighted average cost of capital for the project. Um, so the time value of money. So you're not paying all of that all at once. You're going to pay for that project. You're going to borrow the money and spend it and then pay it back over time. So just as way of, of clarifying this, last year, at the beginning of 2021, if you had a dollar you could buy something for that dollar, right? At the end of the year, inflation went up 6.5%. So at the end of the year, that $1 was worth less. It was worth 6.5% less than it was at the beginning of the year because of inflation. So that's, that's, time, that's time value of money number one. So if you put money under your mattress, right, it can't earn interest, inflation goes up, or, or the, the cost of goods and services goes up over time, so those dollars are becoming worth less. So the opportunity cost side of this is you want to put that money to work somehow, right? You could, that money couldn't be sitting, it could be sitting in a savings account, it could be sitting in stocks, it could be sitting in gold or whatever. So you have the, and when it's there, it earns interest, and that interest compounds. So you have these two factors that make money worth less in the future. One is inflation. The other is these opportunity costs. So if you're comparing different delivery methods, and you could do different things with your cash at different times, how do you compare those two things? You bring everything back to the present value and compare it to today's dollars. 
Okay. So when we remember, we talked about the business case in the, making your procurement decision. Well, this is what you're doing. You take all of those costs in a cash flow over time, right? By month or by quarter or by year. And then you look at your sources of uh, you look at your financing and when you need it and how much and how much interest your payments are. And then ultimately you're going to look at, well, where is the cash coming from to pay for that? And we're going to talk about funding last. You then discount that back to today's dollars using different techniques, but ultimately you're trying to get things back to a present value to compare them. And that's where you see the value for money. Is it, is it a, it is art and science, Right what is the discount rate that we should use, right? We can debate that. Typically, you use something that's similar to the, the cost of a municipal bond, for example, because governments typically can, they know, they understand and know what the, that cost of capital is. Um, so this concept is really important when you start thinking about cash flow over time. So... In the case where you pay cash, right, you don't want to borrow money. You just want to pay for costs as they come. The red bars are your construction payments. I took the numbers off in, in, on purpose because this is just con conceptual here. You have a three and a half year construction window. You ramp up with your design. You get bids. The construction starts. And then years two and three, you just go gangbusters. You, you spend all your money. And then you kind of ramp down and finish. And you go into operations. And it's a new building, so you're operating, you know, your operating costs, you're not really spending much money on maintenance. But then after about 20 years, you just have to start fixing things, right? And, and these rehabilitation costs start popping up. This is from a real project that I've, I've stripped it bare. Um, but you, you see the concept, right? You know, over time, you then have to start, these, these, are, these are paying for costs as they come. But that's a lot of money you got to come up with, right, at construction, <clears throat> this is the DBFOM example. You, this could also be a DBOM, right, where the financing is handled by a government entity. This is just the, the point is to spread your financing that capital costs over time. Um, so you see the yellow are public sector costs, like transaction costs, design costs. You have. Um, Management costs during construction. You have you have costs during during the construction period, but you get to the end of construction, and th there's a milestone payment here, and, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But then you start paying for the project, and the blue are all your fixed costs. So think of that as your you know your operating some of your some of your operating costs and all of your your debt that you're paying back. That could be debt and equity or just debt. But those are fixed costs. You know how much you have to pay every month for 30 years if you, you, know, you borrow money from a bank or in, in the bond market. Um, and then the green are your escalating costs. Those are the things that are subject to escalation that you're planning for. So your labor, uh, your materials, things like that, that you know you're going to have to fund. Remember that waterfall I showed you? You've got maintenance reserves and things that you're covering. Um, you could skip some of that and just factor in the labor. Um, you know, if this was a if this was just debt service, you could effectively remove the green, right? And that would be kind of typical procurement and financing. That that would just be a year on year cost, and every every annual budget, you just figure out how much green you need, and hopefully you have it. In a P three, you plan for it ahead, and it's all baked in like this. Milestone payment is when you might be sitting on cash. But you don't want to spend that cash on construction because you don't want that risk. You want a, a turnkey solution, but then you, you, you use that money to pay down your debt right away. So milestone payments are used in infrastructure a lot to help right-size cash available versus how much debt you're going to pay. So milestone payments can be an interesting factor in creating a, an affordable project. Um, okay. So, so these are th these are contrasting cash flows of of projects, and you can see from a time value of money perspective, where is all the cat? Where is all the capital being spent in a pay go? Right, it's now. It's in the next few years. If you finance this, a lot of that money is being paid way out in the future. It's, it's in today's dollars. It's 
50, 60 percent of the value today. So when you discount that all back to present value, this can look attractive. Now, if the interest rate's really high, it probably isn't. If the interest rate is low, it might be. But that's that's the essence of this procurement decision you're making that leads you then to how much risk and how much am I willing to pay for it? And then you answer the financing question. You can kind of see why you have to understand that delivery part first before you dive into financing. So what with those concepts underneath us now, what are the, what are the options? Um, and I want to make sure we talk a little bit about funding. So I'm going to, I'm going to leave some of the detailed reading of some of this for you when you have nothing else to read at night um, to give you some background. I'm going to touch on the high level points of these different fund, these different financing mechanisms. Um, so you have some, you have some nuts and bolts to, to, to use to, to read the detail. So we're talking about municipal financing, okay, and we're talking about different types of, of, of financing that you can use. The United States, by and large, the most common is tax-exempt bonds. So governments can issue federally tax-exempt notes or debt obligations that allow them to spend that money on certain qualified uses like building government facilities. These are typically fixed income um, securities, meaning the bond holders ask for a fixed payment every month or every quarter or semi-annually every year up until all the interest is paid off. And then commonly there's like a balloon payment at the end or you can do it so you're paying principal and interest over time kind of like a, um, a mortgage. Um, but again, the it's really for public use and qual they call the IRS calls them qualified uses and this is where you typically hire um, a financial advisor and or a bond counsel and they help you work through exactly how you present these bonds to the market so that you are conforming to all of the the, the rules and standards as well as you know market expectations of what would be in these bonds. Um, and the key thing at the bottom here is that private use is limited. So, for example, tax exempt bonds, you typically can't have more than there's a, it's called the private the, the private use test. You can't have more than like 10% of what you're building, your financing, be for private use. Um, so, the 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 when I mentioned at the beginning, there's restrictions on the different sources of capital. This is the big one, right? Tax exempt bonds can't be used for private use. So in our example, we want a parking garage, right? We want to charge people and make money on that garage. Well, maybe we have to do two different financings. Maybe we have a small taxable bond and we use the rest as tax exempt because there's a different, there's a private use in there that we can't spend the money on. Did I miss it? Taxable bonds. Effectively, tax-exempt bonds, but they're taxable. There's some exceptions to that over the years. Build America bonds during the, the recession, those were taxable bonds, but then the federal government um, paid back the federal interest to try to stimulate the market. Um, but these, these, offer, um, these offer sort of, they call them risk adjust. With bonds, it's not called interest. It's called yield, right? And the yield is set by where the market is at and what investors sort of expectations are for what they can what they what they will earn on on the 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 promissory note if you will of the of the bond um and so there's kind of what you take to market as a as the bond issuer of what you think your pricing is and then there's what the market's willing to pay and that's what the financial advisor helps you evaluate as you're going to market to get that right um, so when we talk about risk-adjusted yields, that's to the bondholders, right? They're holding your promissory note to pay them, to, that you're going to pay them back. Um, and those are commonly, th those follow basically um, like government-issued taxable bonds typically follow what would be like a, a highly credit worthy private or corporate bond as well. So that's like a, an indicator or, or benchmark um, um, in terms of rates. Um, 
but these are more flexible. They're not limited to government use. You can spend taxable money on government, but you government use, but you can also spend it on on private use because you're paying the tax on it. So a little bit um, of comparison. I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but if you look at the table on the left, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to maybe get up for a second. Press this. Hello. I think it's on the side. Hello. There we go. Okay. So year 2000, you have so you have on the the second column you have tax exempt yield, which is the interest rate effectively, right? And the third column is AAA corporate yield, so that's like taxable debt, okay? And then on the far right, you have the yield spread, so that's the delta, the difference between tax exempt and taxable money. So the saying is, you know, tax exempt is cheaper cost of capital, right? The table tells you otherwise today. Right in five years from now, it'll be you know this came up in our staff meeting earlier. It might be very different in three years, four years from now. We'll see. But again, when you're thinking about financing, these are the things you're looking at with your financial advisor to say, okay, well, what kind of debt do we want to secure and why, and where do we want to use that source of financing in our project, right? So, right now, would it be advantageous to use tax-exempt debt? No. There's really no advantage to doing it. In fact, you'll see in another slide, the rates are even lower right now. Like, as of Monday, the tax-exempt rate is like 2%, right? It's below historic inflation. You wonder why everyone's racing to get stuff done right now. You see on the right here, this graph, this is showing you all the taxable in dark blue, oh, sorry, tax exempt in dark blue, taxable in light gray since 1996. This is just the volume of, of bonds. And then the light blue line is showing the percentage change towards taxable. And you see two huge spikes. One is during the ARA recovery when they had Build America bonds. And so it was very advantageous to use. The federal government said, use Build America bonds for you know, private use, and we'll waive the, the, tax, the, the, the federal tax. Um, and then more recently, tax exempt has started picking up again because you cities re refinance all the time, right? You, you have, you, just like you do your house, the rates lower at a certain point. You say it's worth it's worth refinancing. So, what they said is, in 2018, you can no longer use tax exempt debt to refinance tax exempt debt. You're basically double dipping. So, if you want to refinance, use taxable debt, because the federal government wants to leave that that um, what's the word? They want to leave that. Um, that amount of defer, that that amount of foregone tax revenue at the federal level, they want to leave that as an incentive for new tax tax exempt projects. But if you're refinancing it with the same tax exempt benefit, the federal government's just missing out on all of that. And by the way, the rates are the same. So why don't you just refinance with taxable money and save that that um, that tax exempt nature for new projects? So that that's what happened there. But it's just a really interesting time, right? Because the spread is is non-existent. <clears throat> um, okay, so what are the types of notes? Uh, long-term note. When I say long-term notes, we're basically talking about thirty-year bonds. That's when you talk about bonds. That's the very common term um, or duration. So general obligation bonds are when you go to the voters and you say, "We have a measure to." Repair our, you know, our. Um, we want to repair our schools, right? We want a seismic program to repair all of our schools. This is like, this is like where I'm from in Berkeley. We passed a huge bond, uh, general obligation bond, to do that. We all agreed to increase our property taxes, and that government that 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 was used to pay for and fix all the schools. But we had to vote on it, and that that vote. The, the investors said, well, what's the creditworthiness of Berkeley, the entity? They didn't say, what is the 
what is the likelihood of that project being done successfully? They said, does Berkeley pay their debt or not? What's their credit rating? And how likely is it that they will collect that money and be able to pay this back? Oh, they're double A plus or something. They'll pay it back, no problem. We'll lend them the money. Revenue bond typically is ring-fenced more to a project or a specific revenue stream um, for a specific project as opposed to a more general program like a general obligation bond. Um, and so this is where, this is basically the most common kind of bond for a project is a revenue bond. And so these are where you have, um, sometimes you have revenue coming in, like the toll road example, you actually can demonstrate to the lenders that you can collect X number of dollars a year that's going to more than cover you know, the, the, the debt coverage. Um, and you can prove to them that it's, that it's not that risky, they, they will lend it to you. Um, more commonly is actually revenue that's related to some type of funding. So a sales tax measure, a, um, um, sometimes even just an availability payment. It's the city's willingness to pay, but for a specific project. So like Long Beach was looking at a revenue bond for the project until they saw that the spreads were so low that they could do private financing and get more risk transfer out of it. Um, that's a, so revenue bonds are very common. I, I'm not really going to touch on COPs, but they're also a, a, another sort of form of, of um, revenue bond. Um, and I'm not I'm not steeped in COPs enough to really be able to tell you why you would use a COP over a revenue bond, but COPs are another mechanism that you can use. Um, so here's, here's, as of Monday, what the long-term notes, like with the ratings, the, 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 the interest, the yield scales are. MMD stands for Municipal Market Data. And this company um, in the source here, um, Refinitiv, is effectively a it's it's like the tracker of all the bond market data that everyone follows. So you can see maturity on the left, 30 year, 30 year AAA rated uh, bond, municipal bond, 2.08%. Um, insured means that you have a lower rating, but you're using different insurance mechanisms to um, effectively put belt and suspenders on, on that, um, on that transaction, on that on that bond, and so the the inter there's a little more risk, so the interest rate's a little higher, and then you can see the difference in different sort of submarkets in California and New York, um, but just historic historic lows right now. Um, <clears throat> I had three, what was it three point three before, and now it's down at like two. And I think the point, my point here is that you can have different scales of funding, too. You can do a 10-year note. You can do a 15-year note. It's not always 30 years. But that's, in project finance, 30 years is long enough to cover some of the life cycle costs in a P3. So we, we like to look at 30 years. Um, so a couple other uh, quick examples of um, municipal financing. feedback here. Joint Powers Authority, this is something that you can use um, with um, in California, and that's where you have more than one entity basically coming together to get something done. You might have, um, you know, you might have a county and a city, or you might have a housing authority and a city getting together to, to build something that gives them independent powers to bond, to collect revenues. Um, to take land, et cetera. Um, private activity bonds are um, a, another form of conduit financing where um, you are issuing tax-exempt bonds for certain qualified uses. Um, <clears throat> and so these are, these are used for in transportation projects sometimes where you have a private use, but you're, you're pledging, um, you're effectively Using you're borrowing tax exempt dollars, but there's a private use associated with it. But it's it's a it's a very specific qualified use. Um, these are both considered conduit 
financings because they're being done by others, not the project sponsor, like the, the city, and they're not being financed by the developer either, right? We also talked about 6320, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. The reason it's not on here, because that's really more like nonprofit financing. So I consider that more of the project finance than, than municipal finance. Um, anticipation notes I'm going to skip, but just think of these as like working capital. This is like short-term notes to get things done prior to a long-term bond issuance. So you might use this to fund design work and you're promising basically the bondholders that you're going to be back in the market within a year or so to do a long-term bond issuance and you're going to pay them back with that money. <clears throat> um, and so that was all municipal financing. In terms of project financing, we talked about the construction loan in the case of the port, right? This is short-term um, expertise from banks to do loans for the construction period. Um, and then you have two different kinds of, of um, bonds that are, I would say, more considered like project financing than, than municipal. So the 6320, we talked about that. That was the, that was the um, um, Vermont corridor where the nonprofit issued the bonds, right? That, that's also, you could consider quasi conduit, but you're, you're trying to get that financing and the risk transfer arm's length from, from the, the public owner. Private placement is where you basically go to um, somebody that is willing to buy all or some of your bonds specifically, not out in the capital market where you're, you're, there's a marketplace where you're buying bonds. You're like sitting in their office saying, here's, here's the project, here's what we'd like you to do. And you negotiate the terms, and they they promised basically to buy to buy your bonds in a in a private transaction. So the, it's a way of almost like you know they're lending money, but they're using it in the in the bond context. And this has actually really driven the market. The private placement market has exploded because of the cheaper cost of capital, and so the private party expectation, private investor expectations for interest rates has gone down and down and down. So like in Long Beach, the private placement was how we financed the city hall and library and stuff. That interest rate was virtually the same as tax-exempt financing. And it had lots of interesting um, beneficial terms like um, delay draw. Um, one important, it's kind of inside baseball, but when you talk about financing and you borrow, you borrowing money through bonds, you get all the money at once, right? the transaction closes and all of a sudden you have all the money you need for your whole project on day one. And now you've got, in some cases you can defer interest, but you've got basically, um, you've got, you've got what's called capitalized interest. You're paying, you're paying interest on money that you're sitting on, but you're not ready to spend it yet. Right? So that's a, that's a cost to the project. Whereas if you can borrow the money and only pay, start paying interest once you actually need to spend it, that lowers the capitalized interest of your project. So if you have questions, I can talk to you offline about how that works. But private placement, it's enabled us, enabled the industry now to just borrow that private money when it's needed. Um, I just had a quick question. Yeah. The city has been considering, like, you know, just having, like, private sector, you know, residential to have, like, you know, you mentioned, it mentions a pre-selected number of investors. Like, people get their name on a plaque in the city hall if they've donated X number. I mean, I don't know if that's something that the folks have considered for, it, yeah. It is. In fact, we, um, the Finance Advisory Committee has been talking about having some sort of po a policy uh, regarding philanthropic um, donations and things to help offset, not cover the entire cost, but offset it. We are working um, on bringing a, a draft policy to the city council, I believe in June is when it's, it, tentatively scheduled to occur. We're looking at um, not only for um, these types of capital projects, but we're looking at expanding that to maybe adopting a median, adopting, a, uh, you know, so we can help beautify the city as well, in, uh, like adopt a tree and things like that. So that policy will be coming to the city council in a few months. I just imagine a lot of folks will be also interested in, you know, just 
investing, like of saying doing that for the, the civic center too. So it's just something sure. that, yeah, I mean, it's kind of exciting. So we, yeah. we sort of, <laughs> the recreation parks department has a very, uh, has, has a similar program to this to offset some of the operational costs. You could, you could adopt a brick. You probably see it at uh, PVIC and things like that. Um, so, and I know it came up with Ladera Linda and we're exploring that um, ultimately to help offset some of the costs that we're incurring for that project. Thanks, Laura. So you brought up philanthropy. So that's a form of funding not financing, and, and I'll want to make sure we, we distinguish that. Hopefully, we'll cover that here. So philanthropy would be like a grant or you know cash from an individual. Now, that individual might also be interested in financing the project and want to buy those private placement bonds, but those would be two different things. Um, so to recap, we got a $120 million project. We need to come up with $200 million dollars to pay back the financing. So where's that money gonna come from? That's the funding question. So, can come from a lot of places, right? It can come from your general fund, but I have a suspicion that general funds are usually spoken for when it comes to uh, budget. Um, so you also have the timing of those funds. When, when do you collect them, right? Are they coming in tomorrow? Are they coming in in 10 years? Or are they coming in in a steady stream? Are they subject to market cycles? How, how do we? How do you? How do? How do you measure that? And then finally, you have restricted uses again, right? You might have, you might have sales tax revenue, but darn, that sales tax revenue was for fixing schools, not for building a government buildings. So can't use it for that. Um, and so what you see on the screen here is how you match your sources and your, your sources and uses of funds. And you can see to pay back that financing, you've got a mix of funding sources of sales tax, grants, a ground lease, right? You maybe you built that structured parking and so you have excess land and you can you're gonna rent that portion of it to a private entity that's gonna build a you know a, a concession or a, some some retail um, next to the park. Right, and then you have development fees. Maybe you update your impact fees, and you start collecting a little more fees to help pay for the park or something. But you you, you have to start now balancing the sources of funds with the use of funds, and more specifically, how you're the timing of how you're paying back that financing. Um, so. Um, I'm gonna. I know we're short on time. Um, you've been interjecting questions as we've been going, so that's been great. I'm gonna just touch on a few highlights, um, but I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna leave this more or less as it is. The sources of funds are varied, right? Starting with the general fund, but also what's flowing into the general fund and from what sources. You've got <clears throat> in the general fund itself. You know, taxes, fees, rentals, charges, fines, interest, all these things. Um, your project might also be lowering operating costs. So you actually might be creating headroom in your operating budgets for other things. Um, that's like for them, like energy efficiency and low water use, and maybe there's less maintenance costs. Um, all the way to if you're in a good year, you might have surplus budget you can use. But most likely, is that you need to raise money somehow, right? And how you do that is most commonly, one way or another, a form of tax or a fee to collect from somebody to do it um, because you have to pay that financing back. So you can do that with a sales tax measure. You could do that with a parcel tax or property tax. You could do special districts where you don't do it Citywide, you do it for the, the folks that are going to benefit from that infrastructure. So um, tax increment financing was used in California and is used in other places. You know, redevelopment is gone in California now. They don't use tax increment so much anymore. That's raising, that's you basically promise to raise land values and to capture that uplift in land value to earmark it to repay the bonds. So when you're building infrastructure like, you know, in a developer wants to develop on the edge of town and they've got to take roads and sewer and all those things, those infrastructure out to meet 
that new community, well, you'd use one of these assessment districts to raise taxes on those that are benefiting from that infrastructure. Um, and it comes in different flavors. Um, and I have lots of bedtime reading for you in here to learn about the differences between those, those things. But they fundamentally work the same way, which is you draw a boundary of a district, could be the city boundary or could be smaller than that, and you evaluate kind of the pros and cons of how you set it up and how you collect the money and um, what that, where that's coming from. You know, like sales tax fluctuate differently than property taxes. Um, so you kind of have to look at the different mechanisms that you'd have. And again, you'd work with a financial advisor to kind of evaluate this or an economist to really evaluate the details of these different funding programs. Um, <clears throat> the other way you can do it is, right, you might have a special, you might earmark money within your general fund. You might have a capital improvement fund. You might apply for grants, right? Um, I'm working with the city of Burbank right now on a project and they are going after a relatively large grant to support design work for um, a new library. Um, and it's going to cover a lot of the expenses associated with that. It's going to be really helpful. Um, higher education is great at philanthropy. They put they put donors' names on buildings, and they get substantial amounts of funds to build new li laboratories and, and, and facilities. Um, that's something I don't think the public sector, like municipal sector, does enough. But I, I think it's possible, especially if you've got active community members that, that want to support um, um, development especially for, for, for the seat of government. And there could be other you know, user fees and things that you can use to collect, to collect funds. Um, so I think that to, to the, the final part on, on, on funding is that you know, you've, this is where the community has to really figure out you know, are we, how, how, do we, how do we generate that excess cash flow Right to cover those to cover those costs, and and they come in the form of taxes or fees um, to go through the general fund so that the city can sign up for an obligation to make payments on the financing, which is what you you can see why you'd want to take advantage of the financing now, right? Money is at historic lows; it's it's less than historic inflation. But you still have an obligation to pay, and you have to be able to prove that you can pay it back. So that that becomes that becomes the key challenge, and um, how you build up a debt program in the city is is figuring out the priority of uses of funds and any kind of special funds you might want to use for um, specific projects. So I'm going to stop there and see if we have any questions. Or I went fast through the funding section, so we can talk more about that if you'd like but open it up to anything you guys want to talk about. You mentioned that the city of Long Beach sold land. How significant was that in terms of the, of the project going forward? Did they use it for you know, the life cycle of O&M, or did they, did they um, absorb some of the construction costs, or what, what happened with that? How much money was it? Uh, what fraction of the, of the total budget was it? Uh, it was a $520 million project. Um, that included $30 million from private land sales. So the city, meaning the city was fee simple sale, outright sale of the land to the private entity. Now, there were two different components to that. One was upfront. They sold some land and, and put the money into the pot up in the beginning of construction. That was a, about a $8 million, $9 million transaction. That was at 3rd and Pacific. The bigger transaction was the city, where the city hall was. And so what they were doing, what they wanted to do is say, when you are done with construction, we'll put that, so that parcel sat in escrow. So the private developer put their money in escrow, or a parent guarantee actually, to buy it. And the city put the, the deed of trust in, the, in, the, in, the, um, in escrow. And then when construction completed, that transaction would happen. And then suddenly the developer would have paid the city. The city would then... The, the city effectively turned right around and used that money to pay for the park, the Lincoln Park. And so they bought down. There was no real need for debt 
to build the park because that money was in the transaction. So that's a long way of saying they bought down the capital cost using that, using those private proceeds. How many acres? About five acres, I think. And that was how was that zoned? It had just been rezoned through a downtown specific plan update that the city had gone through before the the project. Um, I don't remember like the FAR and allowable development, but it was substantial because it was right in the heart of downtown. It was commercial? Mixed use. Mixed use. Yep. Yep. If I just bludgeoned you with information, I'm happy to stay longer and answer questions. Oh, yeah, that we did have a question about uh, whether the PowerPoint presentation will be available online. It will be posted uh, perhaps by tomorrow or the latest on Monday. Yeah, in, in fact, um, we recorded this session as well as this afternoon session, so we'll post that and make that available to the public along with the PowerPoint presentation. I think this, this, you know, the the. The intent here was to just gen be very general, look at the nuts and bolts behind municipal financing, and 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 I hope you benefited from this because I know I, I've I've done this and I've I've misused the words financing and funding, and, and now it's very clear to me, and I hope clear to you, the difference between the two, and these these are three major components to a, a, a municipal finance. Uh, a municipal project. You got to figure. You got to identify early on how you're going to deliver that project. Then you'll figure out how to finance it, and then how are you going to pay for for what you 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 finance it. Earlier today, we were talking about how um, if a city has the cash, then and there's a project, you may not have a debt. You may not need to uh, really. Um, Fund it, finance it, because you're just going to upfront pay for it. And um, so, so then, but then sometimes if you do use that cash from your reserves, you may want to uh, replenish that. So then you you kind of figure out how, a strategy on how to to fund and re to replenish the account. So these are all things that are going to come out in the discussions in the months to come. But now you have that 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 fundamental basis for you to be thinking about as we go through um, for, the, for the Civic Center and any other projects we look at. I, I, and I don't know if we've got, because I know we've got some members that are participating virtually if we want to ask, see if there's any questions aside from the one question, Matt. You guys want to pan out? I, I, have, I have one question. Do we have a copy of this presentation? Yes, we do, and we will, make, okay. we will provide it to Because uh, there was so much information in some of those charts that there, was no t there wasn't there was sufficient time to read it, and I'd like to get to read it in depth. So Absolutely. We'll make copy, it I appreciate it. Yes, we'll make it available, and if, if, if you have a question after you've studied it, you know, just reach out to me, and then we'll forward it on to Ryan and, and if we can't answer it on our own. After, after hearing this twice, I think I may be able to answer some of these questions. Okay. Very good. So do we have any other items on the agenda? Okay. Hearing none. Sounds like it's about time to adjourn. Do we have a motion? I don't think a motion is needed to adjourn. Not needed. Hearing, oh, hearing, hearing no, other, hearing no other comments, we are adjourned. Well, and, and, and on that note, I just want to welcome you all back in person. It was nice seeing everybody. Oh, yeah. And, and to extend our appreciation to Ryan yeah. from flying down from the, the Bay Area to be here uh, today. And I know you've done a lot of talking in the last few hours, so you need to rest your voice now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, all right.